Well, I did have a preaching message, but it's going to be a little bit different for you today, okay? I want to exhort you a little bit, but uh, I actually had a message on the rapture. And I figured it was going to be good if I was the only one that was shouting and be good, because <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. And I'm going to predict something on the rapture. Are you ready? It's coming. Hey! Amen. All right. Thank God it is. All right. Second Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, we went out preaching today, and I want to thank uh, uh, Brother Gorski, wherever he's at. Uh, those, uh, uh, you know, uh, I kind of strain my voice a little bit here once in a while. I get carried away, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to act like I'm old, okay? So uh, I don't try to act like I'm old. You don't have to feel sorry for me. I feel pretty good, so... Uh, he gave me here a couple of years back a thing called an AK-38. Amen. Does anybody know what an AK-38 is? He does. Okay, Boogie, tell us what an AK-38 is. <laughs> sound system. He preached with me today, all right. And so <laughs> it's a sound system, AK-38. You don't have to worry about the size of your magazine or anything. It just shoots and shoots and shoots and shoots. And I don't have to use my voice. Good, man. Amen. All right. So we're glad for that. And had a good time. And uh, Brother Noel's gone. Oh, man. That's the only other southern boy I know of. But here I'm all by myself or surrounded by Yankees. <laughs> When I was in Bible school, I told all them Yankees that come from up north, up there, to, they didn't know what they was getting into, number one. And number two, I said, I don't have a thing in the world against Yankees. But that doesn't mean I'm going to let my daughter marry one. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. It is good to be here today. And uh, man, I have had a good time. This is a blessing. And uh, hearing about Brother... Kim and his church, getting this church, and uh, just thank God for it. We've been praying for them. They've been a blessing to us, and I'm sure that you, kind of a small crowd here tonight. Did they know I was preaching first? Huh. All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, and verse number 1. And uh, also, I'm thinking about maybe it would get, uh, I just had one of my men go back to his hometown in Mississippi, and it had 20 members, and uh, his old church. And he went back, and now they have 15 deacons and 20 members. So, you know, I'm, I'm, a gonna, I'm going to plead with all you deacons here. Get Brother Jerry to do the announcements. I like that voice he's got. I can't hear him. <laughs> the only time he got low last night when he said... Go to church. <laughs> that was a deep message. I knew he could get deep. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Lord, we do that tonight. We have had it. Lord, it has been good. I pray it'll stay that way and I pray you'll meet with us and get in this thing and stir us up that we might stir you up in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to exhort you a little bit here. Now, uh, I, I, to do that, I'm going to give my testimony a little bit. And uh, listen, I, I was not a gangster. I was not a druggie. I was just an old redneck do nothing, amounting to nothing, okay? I've got nothing really in my background that you would like to hear, and, uh, and that's good. I was in uh, the canteen at the paper mill. I was a millwright at a uh, paper mill in Panama City, Florida. And uh, I went in the canteen for a break, and my best friend came in, and this was on February the 12th of 1975. And my best friend came in the canteen, and uh, I looked at him, and I said, Roger, what happened to you? Because, I mean, we were best friends. I knew him. He looked different. There was something different about his countenance, and I said, what happened to you? And he said, the best thing that's ever happened to me, I got saved last night at church. And I said, blankety blank, and went out. I did. But that I couldn't get over. Now, I did that. I walked out and I said, well, you know, that wasn't what I was looking for. And, and for the next three weeks, man, that's all I could think about. I was going to hell and I wanted to get saved. Now, that may be selfish, 
Because when I went to the altar and got saved in church on Wednesday night on March 5th, 1975, I went there so I could get escape hell. That's a little bit selfish, isn't it? But it works. I'll tell you that. But anyway, he saved me, and uh, it was three weeks, and I'm not going to go into all that happened during the three weeks, but we did have, uh, we had, uh, I was an apprentice at the time for a beer mill ride. I wasn't a, a journeyman yet, and uh, it got so good there. And then in the class, we had about 40 people. In the class, we started having some Bible studies because I was asking questions. It got a couple other Christians going, and they spoke up, and pretty soon we were having Bible studies in the apprenticeship class, and the teacher never stopped us. So uh, anyway, I got saved. And uh, uh, I had a 73 GMC pickup. And uh, when the Carson Judah gave the invitation, he was an evangelist that night. I had invited him to church after uh, Brother uh, uh, Roger had witnessed to me. And he was preaching on Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. And if you know what that is, if you don't, you can look it up. All right? And uh, uh, he gave an invitation. I came down to get saved with about three or four, uh, five, six, seven, eight year old kids. And I got saved. And uh, that GMC pickup, I bought it to hunt. I was a hunter. I was uh, hunted hogs. I hunted deer. And uh, I bought it with a short bed step side, you know, so I could get around in the woods real fast. And <laughs> what a life. I mean, that's all I did is chase them things around. But anyway, uh, on the way home, me and that shirt, I don't know how that truck got home, but we just jumped and we hollered and we screamed and we carried on. I was tickled to be saved. Amen. Amen. And so, I mean, man, I, 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 after that, you know, I went to a paper mill and I told everybody I got saved. And then the charismatics come out of the woodwork. Now, if you're a charismatic here tonight, I feel for you, you can change. All right. All right. They came out of the woodwork. They wanted to witness to me then. And say, I needed to do this and I needed to do that. And if you felt this, and I said, man, I got saved. I'm not going to hell. But they came out of the woods then. But after a while... Uh, I went to, I actually have a doctor's degree also. Y'all didn't know that, did you? But an old redneck boy like me, I don't press anybody as a doctor, do I? No. But I went to a little seminary and I did get a doctor's degree, but uh, it just left me empty. And uh, somebody at my church, I got saved in the Bible believing church, but my pastor wasn't exactly a fan of PSR. <laughs> He said, all he does is teach people how to scream on the street corner and have a bad attitude. <laughs> Thus, the bad attitude Baptist blow out. Yeah. All right. And so uh, <laughs> I went anyway to school, and uh, I was going to go to school, and I was preparing to school. Uh, one thing I didn't do is I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> and uh, she got saved right after me. 19 days after me, uh, Brother Johnny came out there. Uh, our living room and she got on the floor and she asked the Lord to save her and she got saved too. Thank God. Because I'm telling you something, there were some bad times there for a few weeks after I came home and all I wanted to do was go to church and read my Bible and, and stuff like that. It really, it's a drastic change, folks. That is a drastic change. And uh, so, Anyway, I was preparing and I still forgot to tell my wife I was going to go to Bible school. I made up my mind. I was going. I mean, myself and Edward Cutchin went over to a, a revival meeting. That was in the old building, in the old room. It was just, it wasn't half as big as this right here. Uh, some of you, how many, you know, I graduated in 81. How many is that old? <laughs> I older than 1981, see? So I was there. And so uh, Marty Few was preaching on Psalm 11.5 and Brother Cutchin and I went over there to check it out. And that place was packed. It was standing room only. And when it was all over, Marty Few was preaching, and he jumped up on top of the pulpit and stood on it and preached. And that place just went, it went wild and there was nowhere to go. <laughs> it was elbow to elbow. We had to run in place. <laughs> so we decided, Edward and I, we both decided, Edward Cutchin, Greg Reinhardt, and myself, we're all saved in the same church in Panama City, a little Southern Baptist church. I'm a licensed Southern Baptist preacher, and I preach like a Southern Baptist, okay? All right, so uh, I, I come home one day because there was somebody at the paper mill that was, did part-time real estate. And I walked in the house, and I said, Honey, this is my wife's name, Linda. I said, Linda, this is so-and-so. And he's going over, over the house. We're putting it up for sale and going to Pensacola. Well, she didn't say much. <laughs> 
And honest to God, she never did. I mean, thank God. She's came up with me, but through hard, some hard, hard times, man. And she stayed with me all the way. Amen. What a blessing. Uh, she's not very spiritual, but I tell you what, she takes care of me. But I have been told a time or two, I'm not very spiritual either. But I will be one day. Amen. You just wait on it. I am going to be. That's right for sure. But uh, I went to Bible school, and uh, at, at, in 1978, I went to Bible school, Pensacola Bible Institute. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I made it all the way through, did everything. I flunked the test on English and I had to sit through Mrs. Meacham, Miss Meacham, <laughs> by two points. You know, that's the worst thing I ever did. But anyway, after it was all over, 1981, I graduated. And I went around and tried to find a church and nobody really wanted me. And my wife's from Lodi, California. The reason I married to her is her dad was in the Air Force. There's a Tyndall Air Force base there. And that was his last assignment before he retired and came back to California. So I married my wife. She's from Lodi. And I'd come to California two times. One time we were lost before we got saved. And the second time was after we got saved. And I thought about California the same the second time as I did the first time. These people, where are they going so fast? How come they're moving? How about, I mean, I'm a southern boy. I mean, I stayed in the same place all my life, you know, and they're moving. And I go by I-5, I'm coming up here, and there's a car on the side of the road, and all the windows are smashed, and the doors are beat in. And I'm saying, man, who wants to live in this place? But man, I went around and I could get nobody that wanted me to preach. I went to Jackson, Alabama. I went to Tallahassee, Florida and some other places, you know, and uh, they didn't want me. So Dan Gilbert wrote me a letter. I don't know if any of you know Dan Gilbert, but he's the only reason I passed Hebrew, but I passed it. Don't y'all know I passed Hebrew. That is an amazing thing. All I never knew when I was a boy uh, was a squirrel dog and a rifle. And so it's hard to get a hold of Hebrew when that's all you know. But he got me through. He wrote me a letter. He had taken that church down in Tahunga. And he said, it's wide open out here. And I said, man, Lord, I got nowhere else to go. And just so happened, my in-laws lived in Lodi. And so they let me stay there, my family stay there, which I don't recommend. It, didn't, it worked out all right, but it was a little kind of tough. But... I want to say this, the Lord got me my attention to come to California and I did not want to. Matter of fact, I had already told him after the second time I went to California, I'll go anywhere but California. And I've always figured from that, you ought to be careful what you tell him. I really do. You just got to be careful. But here I am. And, uh, uh, you know, I tried to start a church in Lodi and that's where we went. I did that for about a year and a half, let a couple of people I had a couple of, you know, living room meetings, but it didn't pan out. And then I put Dr. Ruckman on the uh, uh, local Christian radio station there in Lodi, and some people from uh, Grass Valley, California, uh, called me wanting to take a church down there. And that's where I'm at right now. It's actually in Rough and Ready. It's a little community outside. And when I first got there, I'm going I'm to tell you this because uh, there's a lot of young people here and a lot of uh, young Christians here and know where you're all from. I'm sure you're not all from uh, Brother Kim's church, and uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not an exception. What happened to me is, is, is not something that's peculiar to me. It's the Lord. Amen. And He works in all kinds of ways, and I'll be honest with you, I did not want to come to California. But anyway, let me go on with this. Uh, uh, and they called me about a church their pastor had left. And they called me, I wanted to be a candidate, and I went in there, and they actually wanted me, which was a surprise. So we moved there. And when I first got there, one of the reasons that I got the church was there were three families in there that had every tape and every book that Dr. Ruckman ever wrote or recorded. Now, in our church right now, I just barely got a microphone. And, you know, and they say, well, you need to start recording your messages. Or why? I said, everybody will know I stole them. <laughs> I, I don't want that to happen. They'll all know where I got them from. <laughs> well, they had everything. that doc- They wanted me doc- as Dr. Ruckman number two. All right? And it didn't work. It didn't work because I ain't Dr. Ruckman number two. 
I tell those rascals, and I hear this is the truth. I'm not, this is not evangelist. This is not Pastor Kim preaching. I told them I'd dig a ditch for them to tell me what to do. And you know what? A little while. I just kidding you, brother. I just choked. You didn't get it. It went over your head, didn't you? You need a flat top anyway. <laughs> and, and just a couple of months after there, and it, it, was, it was tough times. The church was in a mess. I had to pretty well do without everything. And we got it paid off. I got six acres. I don't have it. The Lord does. Six acres with a church and uh, uh, a parsonage. And uh, it's paid for. I've been paid for for 30-something years. Amen. And uh, 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 anyway, uh, I told uh, the main guy, I won't mention his name, but you wouldn't know him anyway, but uh, I told him I'd dig a ditch and he's not telling me how to be. I'm not Dr. Ruffin. And you don't even know Dr. Ruffin. All some of the stuff you're telling me, you have no idea how Dr. Ruffin is. You know, he was weird. He would eat bones of a chicken. He would take and get a gallon of jalapeno peppers and go fish and then come back with mullet skin and guts all over his fingers and take his tea and stir it with his hand. And then he'd reach in there and get those jalapeno peppers and eat them one right after another. I said, man, he must have an iron gut. I don't know if you guys, any of you that uh, come from PBI, I, I don't even know, Brother Joshua did, did, right? Anybody else come from PBI, graduate from PBI besides Brother Kim? All right, well, you wouldn't know some of these things anyway, but uh, uh, I, I can never remember Dr. Ruckman trying to make us like him. Do you? Do you? He never tried to do that. I mean, you know, why do you expect me to be like him? But anyway, I told him I'd dig a ditch, and pretty soon I was digging the ditch for $4.50 an hour. It was leech line for a septic tank. Amen. And, uh, I, okay, look, uh, 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 those guys gave me a fit. They really gave me a fit. And they finally all left. Brother Glenn got saved not long after that. He'd been with me since he was 18 years old. And uh, he hasn't grown much in mentally since then. <laughs> there's always hope. Yeah, there's always hope. But uh, anyway, we got it all straightened out. We got it all paid for. And I began to love California. I don't know what it is. How can you love California? It can only be the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're going to get along with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit love them through you. He loves them as much as He does you. And He knows what they're like. And He knows what you're like. And He knows what I'm not. I, I can know. So I, I, I begin to love California. California has about 40 million people in it. I went up to Meridian, to Pastor DeMichael's uh, Pastor school a couple of years ago, the last one he had, and that place had boomed. It boomed with all Californians buying houses, buying land and building houses on it, and they're leaving. And uh, even Dr. Ruckman badmouthed California. Now, I don't know if you were there, you weren't there when I was, I know how it is. I know, you know, uh, but you know, a lot of people got saved. Even Jack Wood got saved in California. I mean, you know, he did. So, uh, you know, uh, all I'm saying is this. I had a, uh, a lady in my church. Her son was a missionary in the Philippines. Getty, Rick Getty. If it, I don't know if anybody ever heard of Rick Getty. He was from a little bit different stripe from us. But, and you know, the Philippines is always in turmoil. Uh, kind of like Indonesia and the rest of them, always in turmoil. Something going on there. And he come, come, well, she come up to me one day and she said, Pastor, said, can you pray that God would get Rick off of that place and out of that place and back in the USA so he'd be safe? I said, Mrs. Getty. I said, the safest place for any Christian to be is where they where the Lord wants them. I still believe that. I haven't changed my mind. The safest you said, well, it's rough down there, but if God wants you there, He's still the protector. I read uh, I read about the mountain men, and there's one guy named um, I forget now, he was the first, actually, uh, his, his buddy was named Potts because that brother Potts used to be up there with brother DeMichael in Meridian. I remember his name, but I can't remember 
the first mountain men. I quit reading the books. You know why I quit reading mountain men books? Y'all want to know the truth? Because they badmouthed the Indians when they first got there and they stayed about five or ten years and they became Indians. I said, what do I want to read about this for, man? You're doing it the exact same thing you said they shouldn't do. They were crazy for. A white man's no better. Amen. He's just as wicked as he can be. But anyway, uh, uh, Mrs. Getty didn't get that. But I got it. And I still believe that the safest place is for you to be is where the Lord wants you. And I don't know how many Christians that want a Bible-believing church are not willing to give up anything to go get one. If it's that important, go where the Lord wants you, you'll be better off. Amen. And they, they, they cry to me because they don't have a Bible-believing church. I mean, I don't know how many people from Sacramento have called me. And, uh, you know, uh, listen, if you're going to go to church, and, uh, you know, Sacramento's an hour and 15 minutes or so away from me, you're not going to be loyal and faithful. I mean, there's three things a Christian, a, a church member ought to be loyal at. Three things. He needs to be faithful to church. He needs to be faithful to give. He needs to be faithful to give to missions. How are you going to do that that far away, man? And this is not worth it. When I left Panama City, Florida, excuse me, it's when I left Pensacola, uh, I worked on the hog farm. I made about four fifty an hour the whole time I was there until it, I graduated. Then I got a job at B&K Construction. We were building the paper mill, and I got, I got another millwright job, and then I started making money. But... Uh, I, you know, I worked on a hog farm. We, my wife would do a nursery at night at the school. That's after they shut the nursery down. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we made it. I don't know how we made it. We look back and we say, look, I don't know how we made it. It only had to have been God to make it to what, from there and to come out here. And uh, so, I, I've got something else here, but anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. But I, I want to exhort you to do this. California is a biggest mission field in the states. Maybe in all just about, you know, the biggest, the largest part of the world. And if you're a missionary here tonight, thank God you are. Uh, but I, I've tried to support a couple of times some people from back east that want to come out here and start a church. Well, they never lasted. And I'll, I'll come to a couple of conclusions. Number one, the best thing you can do if you want to start a church is get you a job. And it's going to be tough. I did it with four kids. I did it for, I didn't, I didn't quit to work until I was 70 years old. I'm a little older than that now. Uh, I didn't quit working until I was 70. All right. And I still don't work. I'm a preacher. No preacher works. But California, <laughs> California is a mission field. I, I tell you, some of the brethren have come out here and not made it too. When I came out here, there was Pastor Kim's dad, right, was out here. And uh, uh, it were real Bible believers, it wasn't too many. I mean, Brother Prather had a, one for a while, and he just passed away, and Brother Wilson was there. Uh, Tony Murga was there for a while, and uh, he didn't make it either. And, uh, uh, and a lot of them came. I say a lot, a few came, and they never made it. And then those that I supported, on told support from back east, they didn't stay. Now, I'll tell you what, if you're young, go out in any of these towns. I don't, uh, if you, how many miles do you have to go here to find another million people in this Bay Area? Ten miles, maybe? Find another million? Okay. Uh, you got room for another one around here in the Bay Area? Another Bible even work? Yeah, exactly. You need more. You get you a job. The reason you want to get us a job because if you take support, number one, they're not going to like you being in California anyway. And number two is, especially if you've got teenage daughters, the only people you're going to get is young teenage boys. <laughs> you say you don't believe that? I've seen it. And as soon as the girl gets hitched up or leaves, the young men leave. I, I had it happen in my church. I know that, see? Okay. But listen, 
Why? If you can reach any race of people in California, how come more people are not coming out here to reach that race? Uh, That is a question I don't know that I can answer, but it may be because it's easier to get support to go overseas, and it is, right? And I'm not saying we don't need to go to overseas. I'm not saying that. But somewhere around the point, uh, somewhere you've got to realize that there is everything in the world in this state. And plenty of them. You want to hunt Tongan? Uh, you go down to Southern California, you go around some communities and they'll have their pit and they're all in the backyard roasting a pig Amen. from Tonga. I mean, that little bitty place. And if I can work a job till I'm 70, uh, Gerald Sutek taught me how to wash windows. I'm going to tell you, that's good money in washing domestic windows. Forget the commercial. But there's a lot of money in it. I, I, made, I made enough washing windows that I can make $30 an hour and pay my two daughters $15 an hour to help me. So You don't understand some of these rich people. It has to be spotless. Now, if you can't wash, if you leave anything on them, you're not going to come back. But I'll tell you, uh, if you don't mind ladder work, I've been on the end of a 28-foot ladder stretching as far as I can on my tippy toes. They say you I'm making a living. I'm, I'm not have to worry about anybody going to cut me off. Because that one guy, the lead guy, those three guys that had Dr. Ruckman's books and all of his tapes, after I told him he couldn't tell me what to do, and I could dig a ditch before I'd let him, he came to church the next Sunday. I passed the offering plate, and he made sure I was looking. And he pulled up a $1 bill. Wow. Waved it at me. I stayed, he's gone. I stayed, he's gone. You see, the Lord can give you stick to itiveness too. Down in Florida, where I'm from, we had what we call the three year cycle. They get a new preacher. First year, he is a great preacher. The second year, so so. Third year, we need something fresh. Amen. I, I listen, the can I tell you the truth? Here I am a few years over 70. I think I get better stuff now than I ever did. Wow. I, I really do. Sometimes I cry. Because I ain't gonna last much longer. And I'm getting all this good stuff. <laughs> if you're a church member. I want you to give me outside of a sexual sin or stealing money from the offering plate or whatever it is. I hear people that say, well, I, I've had this happen several times, Brother Kim. A group will come from another church, usually a fundamentalist church. They're a group, six or eight. That's all what my, my bells start dinging. And they're not jingle bells either. All right. <laughs> when you see a group come, you better be careful how you handle that thing. And I just don't like it at all. When I get it, I never want to, one time a lady came from church over there in, in Yuba City and she came up there and she was looking for another church and I preached that message on the safest place to be is where God wants you. And she, and my pianist was gone that day. She played the piano and everything. And after the sermon, she got up she says, I gotta go back to my church. I said, Lord, why did I have to preach that one? She said, that's where I belong. I'm going back, okay? Hey, it worked on one. Ah, glory to God. I mean, just because you don't like the preacher, you want to leave? (laughs) If you don't, if you like everything I I say and I preach, I suspicion you. I suspicion myself. You know how many times I've had to repent? I hate getting in the pulpit and apologizing for being stupid. Amen, brother. We all have our stupid spells, don't we? Sometimes, amen. (laughs) We do. Sometimes this pulpit is used in the wrong way. It is a powerful, holy place 
And man, you've got to quit that stuff and repent of it. God loves these people. I want to love these people. I love California. He wants California to have a thousand preachers in this area. When I left the paper mill, I gave my two weeks notice that I was going to Pensacola to Bible Institute. They started taking bets on how long I'd last. I stayed around PBI for a year. I I didn't leave till August the 2nd, uh, 1982. Because I was trying to find a church. I couldn't find one, all right? And then I told my family, and I got six brothers, and my mother and dad, I said, I'm moving to California. Well, their drawers dropped. (laughs) You know how that happens? Usually from blowing a lot of smoke. Okay, anyway. They said, California? Well, look, you just call me when you get ready to come back and I'll pay your ticket to come back. <laughs> Amen. They, and then I told them, they said, well, well what are you going to do? And uh, you got any money? I had to tell you all something. When I came to California, I had a letter from Dan Gilbert. I did have a house to stay in a Lodi, in my in-law's house. I will say that, okay? I can't deny that. I had $1,000 in my pocket. A 72 Ford ranch wagon station wagon. Four children. One of them was born on June the 4th. I was leaving on August the 2nd. And a 6 by 10 trailer behind that ranch wagon with everything in the world I owned. I got more junk you can shake your stick at now. I don't owe anybody anything except my electric bill. And I'm threatening not to pay them because they're always cutting our power off up there. (laughs) Amen. Okay. But I'm not special. I'm not somebody that's extraordinary. My IQ is about half of your pastors. But I'm smarter than he is. I don't mean anything. (laughs) Okay. If they can do it for me, if he will do it for me, he'll do it for anybody that's got guts enough to do it. And listen, stay in your church. You say, well, I want to see the pastor change. What can you stick in prayer closet? Not in his face, not behind his back, especially not behind his back. Amen. I've been there, I've done that, I've seen it all. This place is wide open, mission field. I bet you today when we were preaching at that uh, shopping center or mall or whatever it was, I bet you there's 5,000 people read a scripture that they would have never read had it not been there on that street corner. Now, I don't believe you can build a church off street preaching, but it needs to be done. But folks, how do, how do you give out a church? How do you give out a homes to visit here? <laughs> How do you do that? They got them stacked on top of each other. You know, in my place where I'm at, I step out with my rifle and shoot it in the backyard. Hey Amen. I went out there one day and this old hawk, and they're very illegal. Everything's illegal in California. If it's fun, it's illegal. <laughs> what? Yeah. I step out my backyard and there's this red-breasted hawk got my... A, a, a yellow Buffington rooster on the ground trying to eat his head off. I got my shotgun. I sn- he was busy eating. You got to be careful when you're eating, you know. He was busy eating. I walked up and blew him to where he never messed with my chicken anymore. You see, folks, folks, listen. One reason I'm, I'm still in the ministry is because I have something else to do once in a while when it all goes sour and it all goes bad. And you feel like, you know, what in the world am I doing here? I have an out. It's a trigger. (laughs) I get my coyote calls out. I go out in the woods by myself. (laughs) Boy, you can get to, I mean, it's just kind of like, uh, a, ma- a major pain. I ain't killed nothing in two weeks. I got to get out there and do something. <laughs> One time Brother Bailey went down to Brother Fisher's uh, uh, a meeting 
And in between times, uh, some, somebody walked up to Brother Bailey and said, what you going to do? He said, I'm going to go get my uh, uh, surfing suit on. I'm going to go surfing. And the gentleman, the spiritual gentleman said, that is not very spiritual. <laughs> he said, yep, but I'm still in the ministry. <laughs> it's all yours, brother. God bless you. <laughs> 